Okay, please, the next speaker uh, is Ricardo Tedeschi from the University of Bologna, where he's a PhD student. And now we will move to on the hardware side of his five. Please. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. First of all, I want to stress the fact that this work is the result of a successful cooperation between industry and academia. So we've heard in previous talks that uh, an open source community can benefit everyone. This is an example. So a lot of people put effort into, say, further boosting, in this case, the performance of the super scalar version of CV6. So this work stems from the observation that obviously there is a growing demand for autonomy and obviously performance in typically, let's say, traditionally embedded uh, domains like uh, automotive, uh, industrial robotics, and aerospace. We've even heard previous talks stressing this point. So we want higher performance CPUs. And the RISC-V ecosystem is obviously providing a lot of good answers to, let's say, this call to action. And here are just, let's say, a few listed that you can also see, let's say, around these booths and posters uh, in this summit. And among those, we have CV6, which you've probably heard already. But it's a configurable 64 or 32-bit RISC-V core, which was originally developed by PULP, my, let's say, research group. But then, say, it's now maintained and uh, developed by OpenRD Group with many industrial and academic partners, as I said before. So it is six-stage pipeline in order dispatch out of order completion in order commit. So let's say it's a scalar structure, which uh, is somewhat limited in the IPC that it can provide. And this is, let's say, the first observation. And this is the point where Thales uh, provided the first version of the superscalar uh, version of CV6, which basically it's the original core with the additional changes you would expect to uh, make it superscalar. So we have, let's say, two times the instruction fetch width, we double the decoding logic, the issue logic, and we add a secondary ALU as a new functional unit. This work, this additional work, built on tops of CV6S, let's say the superscalar variant of CV6, and we systematically tried to find and spot all the bottlenecks that were left, and we proposed a solution to them. So namely, we introduced register renaming to avoid right after right, after right hazards. Um, I don't know what happened in the conversion, but uh, uh, we also added the improved branch predictor. We have ALU to ALU for wording. FPU support, as this one was originally out of scope for the superscalar version of CV6. Obviously, it's there in the scalar version, so now we also have it integrated in this new CV6S Plus version. And lastly, we, sorry, this one was probably not on me, <laughs> the slides were originally correct, but we integrate it and evaluate it, let's say, on CV6S Plus, plus the open order. Um, high performance data cache, so the HPD cache that you might have heard previously from, uh, let's say, CA and now, let's say, IRIA. So, let's start. Luckily, this slide has survived the, uh, some formal change. Um, so, we can start from the baseline. This is CV6S. As we said before, we have, let's say, the original core with additional changes. The FPU support is missing, but what else can be improved at this point? So to answer this question, we went, uh, let's say, on with a systematic analysis of all the bottlenecks on the M-Bench IoT suite of uh, uh, workloads. So uh, workloads tailored to IoT nodes. So here you have, let's say, this plot, which basically shows the probability of different uh, stall, let's say, conditions throughout the pipeline, normalized to the cycle count. So basically, this is, let's say, the probability, as I said. And the events they monitored are four. Instruction queue is empty, let's say the red one, the first one, which means that uh, the front end has no instructions to feed the pipeline. Cycles where we are dual issuing, so this is the optimal case for our core. Cycles where we are single issuing, so something is preventing us from fully, fully utilizing our pipeline. Or cycles where we are completely stalling. So the main reason for, for uh, uh, instruction queue being empty is branch misprediction. So the obvious answer is to provide a better branch predictor. Then we, have, we are already dual issuing in 30% of the cycles. This is the optimal scenario in a, let's say, a dual issue superscalar core. So here nothing has to be done. But let's say in the same amount of cycles, 
sometimes we are single issuing. So the main reason in this case is instruction dependencies. And to solve it, since a lot of dependencies are between ALU to ALU operations, we can add a, a combinational forwarding between the two functional units that we have. So we have two ALUs, we can add forwarding. Lastly, one of the reasons for stalling, not the major one, but let's say a non-negligible one, is write after write hazards, which are, let's say, false dependencies. So let's say the textbook solution is adding a renaming scheme to our core. So let's delve into the pipeline changes that we made. So first of all, we can focus on the private, uh, sorry, on the branch predictor, which now has become, let's say, a private history branch predictor. So the original predictor simply used a slice of bits from the PC to index into a table of saturation counters. So you can think it of a, a four-state finite state machine, which let's say 0, 1 means not taken, 2 or 3 means taken. So we kind of have, let's say, a little bit of inertia when uh, we switch between states. So every time we resolve a branch, we can just update the counter and by adding one or subtracting one. But this, is, uh, this methodology uh, uses as the only information the address of the PC. We have no information on how we reached that specific branch because, let's say, dynamic uh, execution can reach the same branch through different paths. So what we did is adding a private history table so the idea is that in this case, we first use the bits of the PC to index into a table which keep tracks of all the individual histories of the different branches. So in this case, for example, this branch is, let's say, the previous outcomes were not taken, taken, not taken. Then each entry has its own dedicated saturation counter that we can index by using the history. So now the history on how we reach this specific branch plays a role in the decision process. And this, let's say, boosts up uh, the, let's say, uh, correct prediction rate from 82% to 92%. Then we introduce the register renaming scheme. You uh, can see that it is located in the scoreboard in this specific pipeline, which also acts as, let's say, a reorder buffer. So the scoreboard is this circular buffer which tracks all the information about the instructions that uh, we want to issue, that we are executing, that have completed. Among all this information, we track, let's say, the destination register of it. And a new instruction that arrives um, and there's some read after write uh, hazard, need to know which is the newest instruction to read, uh, let's say, the results from. Basically, the reorder entry, we want to read our results. This is, let's say, not present now in uh, the original CV6. So this renaming scheme, um, we can explain it by looking at an example. Let's say two instructions write the same register, X12. So we have a commit pointer which tells us which is the oldest instruction that, the, let's say, it's in flight, that it's valid inside the scoreboard. So we can rotate the scoreboard, it's a circular buffer, to introduce a form of priority. So we know that in this case, instruction zero, for example, uh, has a higher priority than instruction five. And it is the one that should provide uh, the data because it is the newest one, let's say, in the dynamic instruction uh, stream. And so we can, let's say, then decide which register should read, let's say, the results from uh, which scoreboard if we want to do forwarding to solve read after write hazards. And we are effectively renaming because we are no longer using destination register addresses, but uh, the ID of the scoreboard. Next, we add the floating point support. Let's say here, uh, nothing new. It's uh, the FPU that is also present in the CV6 scalar version, but we added the structural hazard logic needed to uh, safely, let's say, issue instructions of the FPU without uh, uh, causing contention on uh, write-back ports. Then we added LU to LU forwarding. So we have two LUs, but we noted that a lot of times they were not used because we had back-to-back -back instructions and we are issuing in order uh, that had a uh, read-after-write dependencies. So we had to go first through the LU0, write it back, and then LU1. This is, let's say, inefficient. So the, first, the easy solution is just to have two LUs, which we can use separately. So let's say if the instructions have no dependencies, we just have two dedicated paths. But if they have a dependency, we can just steer the result from ALU0 and pass it as an operand to ALU1. You might ask, this is a very long combinational path. No, because we uh, took care of, uh, say, uh, separating few selected operations. As of now, it's only the population count operation uh, on, let's say, outside of the ALUs, so that those instructions, let's say, behave as previously, but the remaining instructions can be changed safely and there is no particular timing regression. So to evaluate this pipeline performance improvement, we 
go back to our Envench IoT. The evaluation is done so that we have the same cache configuration. And since the working set is fully cached, say once the caches are uh, warm, there is basically no role of the caches. We have no misses. So all these benefits comes from the pipeline improvements. And we see that we are 43.5% better than the Scalar CV6 version and almost 11% better than the original uh, Super Scalar version that we started from. So let's say the performance seems to be uh, improving quite a lot. What is the cost in RN timing? GF22 technology, worst timing corner. Once again, same evaluation. Here we are just comparing the Scalar core and the Super Scalar one, let's say the improved one. Uh, simply because the other one does not have the FPU. So this one would obviously skew the results. Uh, so what do we see? The pipeline area increases by 28%, but the total area, including the caches, is 9% bigger. So this is only 9% area overhead. There is no timing regression. Let's say here the maximum frequency in this technology is almost 1.1 gigahertz, let's say, and we have only a 0.5% regression over CV6. So virtually no regression to obtain our 43.5% IPC improvement. So the trade-off is very favorable. The last bottleneck that we found was the cache. So let's say the legacy cache are not highly performant. They are kind of, let's say, blocking. Um, so lucky for us, uh, there is this HPD cache. So the open hardware high performance data cache that you've also uh, heard in other talks which is this pipeline design that uh, say it's tailored to high performance. So we have uh, only a cycle of latency when we hit in the cache. But let's see, the nice feature is that uh, capable of having out of order execution. It's non-blocking, so we avoid any kind of head of line stalling. We can reorder transactions and so on. So this IP is, let's say, a nice complement to uh, the improvements that we've done inside the cache, sorry, inside the pipeline. And it's very configurable, like CV6. So you can have write back and write through policies, even on a cache line level granularity. So say a lot of parameters that can be tuned. We evaluate it once again. In this case, we have the same pipeline, so same CV6 pipeline, and two different cache subsystems. So the legacy data cache and the new uh, HPD cache in write back mode in this case. And the working set is two times the cache capacity. So radar stream are regular and irregular access patterns. So you can think of very long vectors that are accessed sequentially or let's say randomly. And the working set is big enough that we trigger a lot of misses. And we have a 74% bandwidth improvement just by switching the cache. You might ask, what is the cost of 75% bandwidth improvement? Once again, GF22 technology. In this case, uh, let's say same evaluation setup. In this case, there is not even a trade-off. We uh, are 75% better, and we have a cash area reduction of 19 19%. And the, the, let's say the reason we found out to be is uh, better SRAM organization. So the memory macros are handled much more efficiently. So the old cache had very small uh, memory cuts and a lot of them, while here we have better usage uh, of more densely packed data, let's say, into memory macros. So let's say it's not even a trade-off, it's just let's say, a huge improvement in uh, area and uh, bandwidth. So to conclude, we introduced this CV6 S+, plus, let's say the latest and most uh, let's say, performant version of the superscalar flavor of CV6. We integrated it with this uh, high performance data cache. We demonstrated uh, quantitatively uh, that there is an advantage in the um, changes that we've done and the cost is reasonable in terms of area and timing regression, as well as for the cash. So uh, with this, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, if you have any question, I also say I can reply now and I also invite you to visit our PAL platform booth, uh, say, uh, if you have more interesting, more, uh, sorry, more questions about what we do in the open uh, Source Service 5 community as a group. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ricardo. So, yeah, we can take one question maybe because you were on time. So, okay. Good there is one. Hi. Uh, so, thank you for the presentation. Uh, okay. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, what kind of performance tools you used that you showed during this slide? A, what kind of performance tool? Yeah, uh, so how did you use to compare the, the gains that you made at each stage of the pipeline? 
Okay, so let's go back. You mean, for example, this plot, right? Yeah, so when you added the ALU, then there was a... Uh, when you added the uh, ALU forwarding, there was an yes. uh, uh, increase or gain that you get. How did you compare? What tools did you use to uh, compare? Let's say uh, this one were run on... Let's say we integrated CV6 in uh, the Cheshire system on chip, which we have, let's say, in Pulp, which is, let's say, our testbed for CV6, let's say. And it has, let's say, either a kind of out-of-the-box flow of simulation for uh, Quest Sim or, for example, very later, um, and also FPGA implementation. So in these cases, we use the FPGA simply because, I mean, Embench IoT is quite, uh, let's say, fast to run, but the radar streams would take a lot of time since, simply because they are very, let's say, uh, intensive in terms of uh, memory accesses. So we basically did this on FPGA if this was the question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.